Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, today, I'll be talking about the Cordobe subsystem. Uh, my name is Eric Johnson. I'm a firmware solutions engineer with Memfault. And what I'd like to talk about is the Cordobe subsystem in Zephyr and how you can add it into your kind of debugging, debugging workflow to augment your uh, abilities to diagnose faults and, and errors in your system. So a little bit about myself. Uh, again, my name is Eric Johnson. I'm a firmware solutions engineer at Memfault. I uh, help our customers integrate our SDK and then also spend time maintaining our, SD, our MCU SDK. Previously, I worked at uh, Walgreens Health, Athos, Acuity Brands. And while I was at Athos, I attended uh, the ZDS uh, component of Open Source Summit in 2018. That's where I got my first exposure to Zephyr. And my main goal attending that conference was to evaluate Zephyr and see if it, it was ready for us to use. And I've brought it to every single place that I've worked since then. Um, I met our founder, one of our founders, Tyler, at ZDS in 2022. Um, and then, as to my contributions to Zephyr, uh, a handful of just some humble bug fixes to the BLE kernel and shell sub systems that I've encountered while uh, developing devices. So, brief agenda uh, on what I want to talk about today. First, I'll give an overview of what is a core dump, what's contained in it, and then I'll move on to how do core dumps fit in with Zephyr. Uh, go over how are they triggered through the Zephyr cert handling and the fault handling that you get out of the box with Zephyr. I'll cover some of the components of the Cordum subsystem and then move on to the host tooling that's used and some scripting that you can do to start to build up tooling around processing Cordums. I'll finish with a demo and some comments on some future work that I, that I hope to contribute. So uh, Zephyr comes with a really great logging subsystem built into it, but logging can only take you so far in some cases. Uh, we've all been there where you've got a component that produces a really spammy log message or you just collected a bunch of logs over a long period of time and it's hard to sift through this. The, the built-in panic message to Zephyr is also great. It's most RTOSs that I've worked with don't give you one. And so being able to understand when there's a fatal error versus uh, and getting some insight into that versus just your device rebooting is really great. But the problem here is that it's a static picture. It gives you a lot of the details, but you have to piece the picture together yourself. So this is where core dumps come in. Uh, these are triggered by faults, kernel panics, and assertions in your code. And what a core dump will do is it, it's going to capture information from your device on what caused the crash specifically. Um, there are different backends that you can use, and I'll go over those in a little bit. But the key thing is that we either want to stream it out immediately or store it some, to some non-volatile memory because in this state, the di device needs to reboot. So some basic com data components of a core dump itself. What we're doing is we're capturing different regions in RAM uh, and saving them into a, a binary format. In order to decode your threads, you're going to want the kernel structure that your application is running. Um, this will give you insight into the state of each threads when the fault happens. We can also, from this data structure, determine the stack used for each of the threads. You can also capture any other data that's important to you. Maybe you have a sensor uh, running and you've got some sort of ring buffer or uh, you're using some memory slabs and you want to capture the state of that, that data structure. You can include that in your core dump for later analysis. Maybe you are wanting to know, you know how exhausted was the BLE stack um, uh, memory components that are being used so you can understand if, if you need to increase the size of those buffers. Maybe you've got some dynamic memory that you've allocated to the heap you know, for lists or, or other data structures. Those, those can all be in, included as part of your core dump. So how do we get started? How do, how do we move into collecting a core dump? So I'm starting off here showing the uh, call graph that Zephyr uses um, when an assertion is triggered. So there are assert macros. Um, they also both start with double underscore assert. Uh, 
and when that is called, it calls into this assert post action function, which eventually calls some arch specific code that will then trigger your fault handler on your device. The example I'm showing here is for a Cortex M device. So Zephyr uses the um, SVC interrupt to, to trigger this. And one thing to note here is that the assert post action will, when, when we look at the backtrace generated from an assertion, the assert post action will be at the top of the call, the call stack. So frame zero will be assert post action, and then frame one will actually be where the assert was called from. In the case of faults, uh, these are a little bit simpler. The, essentially, the fault happens. It triggers the fault handler and then begins running um, Zephyr's uh, several functions within Zephyr that do some arch specific things and then eventually call into the Cordom subsystem. And the key thing here is that uh, frame zero will be the site of the fault in your code. So this diagram outlines a few components of, of the Cordom subsystem. You can think of the front end as the component that's responsible for formatting the memory regions into a core dump. Um, and the, the front end then drives the back end, which is doing the IO to either stream out the core dump in the case of using the logging back end, or flash or your custom one that it'll write it to your storage medium. Um, the back end is configured through a kconfig, a debug core dump back end. And then, as I said, there's a logging backend uh, that can you know, stream out of your uh, logging console. Um, the flash backend uses, can use partitions defined in device tree for this function. And then there is also the option to implement your own. In terms of what sort of data sources are we capturing, we're going to capture uh, arch, arch specific regions. And these are things like. Uh, the core registers of your, your MCU, the fault handling registers, um, anything that's really specific to your architecture. We'll capture the stacks uh, of each thread. Um, and then there are some newer features where you can define nodes in device tree to capture device specific data. Um, and then you can also at runtime define different memory regions that you would like collected as, as part of your core dump. So, the example that I'm showing here is a device tree node that I've defined to capture the uh, GPIO block of the, um, the Kimu uh, Cortex M3 target. And this is based on a TI uh, Stellaris chip. So uh, I pulled the memory region information from that data sheet and actually from the, the device tree board file for that target. Um, there's two things to note here, the Cordum type, and you'll see that it says mem copy. Uh, this is because we're capturing a Cordum region that, that is memory mapped. So it's safe for us to perform a, a copy across, you know, starting at that first address shown in the memory regions property, and then uh, use the second piece of that, the length. There's a different type uh, of device memory region that you can capture where you implement a callback. And that is for cases where you can't simply just copy RAM. So this is an example of the output collected using the Cordump logging backend. Um, you can see it's encoded as, as uh, ASCII text. Um, we still get the panic print. So you know that, that gets printed off. And we're going to use this output um, save it into a, a file, and then that will become input when we start up our GDB server to load up the core dump itself. So as, as I was mentioning, uh, we take that text output from the logging subsystem, and we use a log converter that Zephyr provides in, uh, as part of some built-in scripts, and we'll convert it into a binary format. Uh, Zephyr's GDB server uses a couple different parsers. One is the ELF parser, and what that does is it uses your symbol file from your application's build to load your text and read-only me yeah, read memory regions. 
and this is used to correlate uh, the PC values to a specific function call, and it allows you to move up and down the call stack. The log parser then collects all that memory that we collected from SRAM um, and builds up memory regions that GDB can query as we use our scripting or, or just run our normal GDB commands that you're used to. The GDB server is provided by Zephyr, and this implements the GDB remote protocol. And what that allows is a client can connect to the server, and then the remote protocol queries those memory regions that we've built up from our core dump and our ELF file. The GDB server uses what's called the GDB stub, and that implements uh, some basic commands that are part of the GDB remote protocol. And there are some Arch-specific code that is required, and so Zephyr has support for different architectures through that. The final piece in this chain is the GDB client, and that's what you typically load up uh, as part of your normal debugging workflow. So as part of GDB, it does have this Python extension support. You can create Python scripts that you can use to run commands uh, in GDB, and it really helps you automate you know, a lot of different tasks that you might want to do as you're examining a core dump. Uh, a few things to note is that Zephyr defaults, uh, the, the Zephyr GDB executable defaults to the no Python version. So when you're trying to use your, uh, examine your core dumps and using some of your uh, scripting extensions, you'll want to add on the dash py uh, suffix. The other note, thing to note is that the, when GDB is built, it sort of hard codes a, a, an expected system Python location. And so you may run into errors uh, when you're first starting out where it says it can't find the Python in your system. And so you'll want to install it into kind of the typical system setup for Python. Um, one thing that we really recommend to use is a virtual environment for all of your GDB scripts. This just helps ke keep the rest of your system isolated from any dependencies those scripts might have. And then we have a package that uh, is called GDB Bundle, and it helps automatically detect GDB scripts that you've written in Python in your virtual environment and brings them and imports them so that when you're running GDB, those are just picked up automatically. There's a lot of annoying and tricky things to set up uh, to get this process started. And GDB Bundle helps you do that in a much more manageable fashion. Um, so I will show a brief demo. Let me switch over. So in this first tab here, uh, I'm just, I, I've collected uh, that output that I showed on a previous slide into a log file, and I'm gonna use the built-in log parser that Zephyr provides to convert this into a binary file that GDB server can load. So I'll go ahead and run that. Uh, what I ran that with is the Python script. The first argument is the log itself that we collected, and the second is just where it's going to be output to. So now we have our core dump dot bin. Um, in the second window here, I'm going to start up GDB server and the two arguments I'm providing are the symbol file that we've built, so that's zephyr.elf, and then the cordum.bin file that we just generated in the previous step. When I run this, uh, this script is going to sit there and wait until a GDB client connects to it. Now, before I run the GDB client, uh, I'm gonna show a, a GDB init script that I've written. Um, this uses a snippet of code that we use to initialize GDB bundle, um, and that's kind of the first half here. And in GDB, um, these are all uh, essentially the commands in yellow are GDB commands. So we start off by Python, and then we write some Python code. This will import GDB bundle and then initialize GDB bundle to set up our Python path to collect all of the GDB extension scripts that we've created. And then finally, I've just added a command to automatically connect to that GDB server that I started in the other tab and is waiting for the client to connect. So I'll exit out of here. And then 
Um, so here I'm using the Zephyr Toolchain's uh, GDB, again with that dash pi suffix. I'm passing in a command option to specify where my GDB init script is. And then finally, we're going to load the L file that we've built with. Um, excellent. I know what the issue is, at least. Did not have my virtual environment activated. OK. So great. At this point, what we've done behind the scenes is load our build, load the core dump, and GDB has jumped to the location where we hit our error in our application. So you can see, and I'll make this a little bit bigger, um, and see at the bottom that we've stopped at calculate transformed reading. This is sort of a toy application that I created for, for the session here today. And uh, we've, we've paused here. And the, the great part now is that we can run you know, most of the GDB commands that you know and love when you're doing regular step debugging. So we can backtrace to see uh, where in our code we came from. Um, in this case, I have a thread called processing thread, and we hit an error uh, at calculate transformed reading. Uh, to show off those extensions that I was talking about, we have um, a couple that I'll demo. I first created one to parse through the GPIO peripheral um, on this target. And so this is just called GPIO. And what it's doing is it's going through one of the GPIO peripherals and uh, walking through each of those pins and kind of spitting out some processed output there. So I'm converting uh, the memory that we collected in our core dump and kind of parsing it to understand whether or not the pins were enabled, what directions they're set to, their current values, the state of their interrupts. Uh, another kind of simple script that uh, I'll demo is um, we can print out the state of the other threads in our system. So here we can see that you know we have our processing thread as we saw. That's where the core dump occurred. Uh, but then we can also see the state of the rest of our system. We can see the system work queue, shell UART, what our logging system was doing. Um, and these are very simple examples, but I'm, my hope is that uh, it gives you ideas on, on how you can really expand your, your debugging capabilities. So I'm going to jump back to the presentation. <laughs> So what are some future work that we can do to the core dump subsystem in Zephyr? So as part of my research for this presentation, uh, I found kind of a serious issue with the Flash backend, and that's that it, it is not totally ISR safe to use. And this is important because when we hit a core dump, we're in a fault handling context, so we, we cannot use interrupts to, uh, or we can't use interrupts. There's no context switching. The core dump subsystem is just running until the system reboots. So uh, that will need to be reworked because the Flash backend uses the Flash, Zephyr's built-in Flash API, and there are different semaphores that are, that are used there. So as soon as we take a semaphore, um, if we have assertions enabled, which is a powerful feature for using core dumps, we go into a lockup. And so this isn't really a suitable backend at the, at the moment. Um, a, a few other improvements that I, I hope to make are allowing the application to override a linker memory region um, that is specified as part of the core dump subsystem. So right now, you can enable a kconfig, and it will use uh, some linker-defined symbols to capture essentially all of RAM. And a lot of times, that's it's not practical. You don't have enough space in your storage medium for that. So uh, allowing kind of a more application-defined region, I think, would be pretty useful. Um, I think what we can do to help triage and diagnose issues that, that users are reporting to Zephyr is to teach users to submit core dumps with each of their bugs and issues. Then a maintainer can load up the core dump and get additional context onto what caused the, the fault or error. Uh, I'd like to add an example using 
the Flash simulation region as a backend. And what this can do is give you a simple way to have your device not connected at your desk, but still collect a, a core dump. Um, as I said, the, the Flash backend has a few issues that need to be worked out, especially when assertions are enabled. So we could use the Flash simulation region to store to a no init region of RAM. And that way, the device can reboot, and the core dump is still in that section of RAM. And then finally, I think there are some West extensions that I'd like to write to uh, kind of take a few of those manual steps that I was doing and automate them. So a little bit on where to find me, uh, LinkedIn, GitHub. Uh, we, Memfault, the company that I work for, we write a blog called The Interrupt, and we put out a lot of different uh, embedded systems topics. Um, highly encourage you to check those out. We have a lot of information on scripting and GDB. Uh, we also, I, I just put up a post on the Ring Buffer API in Zephyr and how best to use it and how it's used in practice. A um, little bit about what we do at Memfault. Um, we obviously, well, core dumps is one of our uh, key features, but this is what a core dump looks like in Memfault. So we do a lot of additional work to add in different details, um, things like state of threads, uh, detecting stack overflows, and then uh, also this is just a, a peek into the different memory regions that we collect and how we process them. Um, just a few quick acknowledgments. I'd like to thank everybody that does maintain the, the Core Dump subsystem. I, I hope to start contributing a lot more to it uh, in the near future. And then uh, also to Daniel Leung, who gave a talk a few years ago on more on the, the guts and the internals of the Core Dump subsystem. Um, and then just included with these slides, the links to GDB Bundle. Uh, please go check that out. We'd love feedback on it. Um, and then the GPIO command that I implemented as part of the demo. So, thanks. He's right there. Amazing stuff. Thank you very much. It was very interesting and fun, fun stuff to be doing. Uh, uh, I, I can guess a few answers to this question, but uh, I'd like to hear your answer. So why did you go with the GDB server approach instead of writing, you know, ELF-based core dump file and then loading that in GDB using normal means? Um, so in this case, for the demo, I was using the uh, logging subsystem output, and so that kind of requires that intermediate step. But you, you certainly could collect the standard ELF format and then have that same GDB server provided by Zephyr, uh, load that in. But like, I mean, on, on host Linux, I would uh, I would just take a core dump file, and I would say GDB, elf, core dump, and GDB would load that. So I was talking about that approach, so without the GDB server. Um, in that case, I think that there are some, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not, not completely sure of the, the technical differences there. Um, if I had to guess, it's because uh, we're, I think the typical GDU server might not know of some of the memory regions that we're loading as part of the, the Zephyr-specific uh, GDB server script. Okay, okay, fair enough. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. There was a talk yesterday about tracing in Zephyr, and they used retained RAM for storing the triggers. Could you imagine also storing your core dump into a retained RAM? I think Linux can also store, I don't, I don't know if it stores core dumps, but it can store lock into ECC protected memory that you can read out on the second boot. Did you consider doing something like that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I m might have touched on that indirectly in the future work slide. Um, so. I think the way to do that right now in Zephyr would be to use 
uh, the Flash simulator functions that, that are built in now. At least I, I was kind of perusing GitHub to see if anybody else had done this in the past. And uh, that, that was actually suggested and, and uh, a feature request was closed because um, you can use the Flash simulation region to mark off that section of RAM. So uh, as long as you define you know, the address of, of the RAM region that, that you're referring to, you should be able to use that there. But you would still go through the flash layer and have the problem with the semaphores, or why is it called uh, flash simulation? Um, yes, that is true. So I think then the second piece there was, and I, I didn't mention this, so this is, this is great a lot. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. The, um, the other piece of work that I'd like to do is, is just adding in another backend specifically for that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any last questions? Great, thank you everyone. <laughs>